and welcome to the inauguration of the new Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering for Sustainability. I'm Nicolo Baldanzini and I'm the coordinator of this new Master. Uh, this Master of Science is, is a new addition to the, uh, the educational offer of the University of Florence. And for this reason, since this is the first academic year, we have decided to kick it off with an event on the topic of the master, that is sustainability. So today we will have a few speeches about sustainability to, to frame this topic within the context of mechanical engineering. Without much ado, uh, I um, introduce the, the first speaker, uh, who is uh, the Vice President of the University of Florence for Education, Professor uh, Ersilia Menesini. She's uh, online uh, and uh, he will... Uh, will Can you her... see me? Hello? Hi, Nicolò. Yeah. Can you see me? You are online. Okay, great. Uh, so I will be the first. <laughs> I will uh, start. Uh, probably uh, Professor Facchini still uh, join us. Joining us. Okay, great. Okay, uh, just a few words as a um, vice rector or deputy for teaching at the University of Florence. Uh, first of all, I want to. Uh, uh, give you the greetings uh, and on behalf of our rector, Professor Alessandra Petrucci, I wish to welcome uh, all the presence uh, at the University of Florence and specifically the new students that are um, recently enrolled in the courses. It's a great pleasure for me to open this new course of mechanical engineering for sustainability. Uh, we are really happy about uh, uh, contributing with new, new academic trainings and courses to professional development of new engineer, engineers skilled and competent in addressing uh, the new challenges of the society. Uh, as you know, there are several emergencies nowadays in the society, among which the topics of the climate change, sustainable development, uh, sustainable go growth are relevant. And uh, 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 we are all trying to address these goals or sustainable developmental goals through uh, our effort and our commitment. So it's really relevant in this regards that the course of mechanical engineering and sustainability will work in this direction. <clears throat> Our university is highly committed to pursue, as I said, the development of sustainable goals and to prepare new generation for the future challenges of the society. Your course is also highly relevant for the internet internationalization. As you know, the course is in English and uh, our university is also committed uh, to develop further uh, the level of internationalization of our courses uh, and uh, uh, we are really uh, happy that you can fit easily fit into some of the main program that we have in terms of uh, internationalization, which is the UniWell. UniWell, as you know, the is uh, the Uni European University of Wellbeing and is one of the uh, alliance that has been selected by the European Commission under the Erasmus Plus program in 2020 and is uh, trying to pursue uh, the well-being of people. And nowadays, uh, pursuing the well-being of people uh, mean that uh, we have to address uh, with uh, some of the main challenges, as we said before, that we have the climate change, new diseases, uh, the problem of populism uh, or uh, new new approach to economical and developmental growth. So uh, uh, this means that uh, you need a holistic and integrated uh, interdisciplinary approach to higher education, to research and innovation that, of course, uh, it's uh, highly relevant also uh, for you as uh, future engineers. Um, uh, the fact that uh, your course will be integrated into uh, the UniWell uh, approach provide also to the students uh, fruitful opportunities uh, to collaborate and to be trained abroad. 
So your course really fits into new plans and new project of development of our university and uh, of global education as a whole, and will prepare you as a future students or future uh, professionals on uh, topics that are highly relevant in terms of uh, uh, new types of energy and uh, new types of mobility or sustainable mobility uh, topics that are really important for the future of our society and our uh, planet we can say so uh, all in all i can say that your teachers and you as new students of new course will be the protagonist of this new area and will follow up and uh, uh, of new area of uh, uh, planning and designing uh, uh, educational training at the university of florence so that's why i think uh, it's very important for us uh, to follow up you in terms of outcomes at the end of the course and possibly also after the placement and the professional careers that you will develop. So again, thanks for uh, starting this new uh, project with us and uh, I wish you a, a very fruitful and very important uh, educational training uh, as a starting point uh, for the courts in this year and for the future years. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Ercilia, for your kind words and encouraging uh, words. Um, and now I introduce uh, the second uh, speaker, uh, Professor Bruno Facchini, uh, the head of the Department uh, of Industrial Engineering, uh, which is uh, the department that uh, mainly promoted uh, this uh, uh, new Master of Science. Bruno. Okay, thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Nicolo, for your kind uh, presentation. I would like to uh, to say welcome to the people uh, here in, the, in that room because I think it's very important to meet each other for this uh, <coughs> uh, important uh, day. Obviously, the the course is ready starting last September, but uh, today is the moment to be here and to uh, see each other, to contribute for uh, this new idea. Uh, industrial engineering uh, probably as uh, uh, one of the main responsible for the, uh, to be honest, for, for the today situation. So it, and I think uh, in our department things to be very uh, uh, very apply for for this mission to to change something to change our our uh, view of the future and so sustainability is the the, the, the key words for for this for this approach and so uh, we need to to uh, rethink again our our mission inside of a research uh, inside of production uh, and uh, inside our department to be able to uh, to fight this, uh, uh, this critical uh, situation for for the future of our of our, of our planet so we need to decline also uh, this uh, this challenge in terms of uh, industrial production, energy management. This is the key elements of our uh, new proposal in terms of a master degree in mechanical engineering and sustainability. So uh, I think this is a key element. We are already spent uh, some time in waiting me because uh, we are in, in the traffic. And this is a clear example of our and capability to, to, to manage uh, sustainability. And uh, uh, so I, I would like to, to thank uh, all together again. And uh, I'm obviously leave my, my position for, for other speaker, but probably more much. interesting and more, and more close to the, but it's our mission and we, 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 we want to, to, to contribute uh, in, for 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 this uh, photo challenge, okay. Thank you very much, Bruno. And now uh, the the next uh, speaker. It's it's a pleasure to 
introduce Mr. Paolo Noccioni, uh, president of uh, Lobo Opinioni BKUX, uh, who will share with us uh, his perspective to sustainability. Thank you, Nicolò. Buongiorno, good morning. A pleasure for me to be here today for the inauguration of uh, this master in uh, mechanical engineering for sustainability that is going also, let's say, to be delivered in English, I understood. Yeah. So for us, for our uh, company, it's a great initiative, I have to say. It contains uh, some elements that uh, myself also as an engineer, I consider uh, very, very important for future engineers. I see attention to innovation. I mean, this is uh, something new. I mean, in the proposal that the University of Florence has, I think. Uh, I see, let's say, the focus on sustainability that, to be honest, is a critical uh, component uh, of, uh, let's say, the challenge that we have in front of us about energy transition. And I see also, let's say, the, the, as a last aspect, uh, this openness to uh, global collaboration and confrontation that, that also is critical, let's say, for the engineers, uh, the engineers of the future. Uh, these three elements, innovation, uh, open to confrontation uh, all around the world, uh, and also the focus on sustainability, are all, uh, let's say, ingredients uh, that companies like us uh, consider crucial, let's say, to, for the future. And for that, I want to, for the launch of this important initiative, I want to thank the University of Florence and the Department of Industrial Engineer, Engineering. So thank you uh, to have launched this important uh, 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 new master. As you heard a moment ago, I am Paolo Nocioni. I am the president of No Opinione. No Opinione is an historical uh, industrial reality of Italy, I would say. I mean, we have 180 years of uh, experience and I would say successes in turbo machinery. Uh, we are now part uh, of the Baker Hughes uh, Group, that is uh, a technology company in the energy sector. We are, uh, let's say, a global, uh, global company. We, we have a global presence. Actually, we have operation in uh, more than 120 countries around the world. Now, as an energy technology company, we are committed uh, to drive the energy transition uh, toward zero emission uh, by 2050. And, um, and uh, let's say this is a commitment, even a personal commitment that we have, and we are working on two parallel tracks. On one side, uh, we are actually, let's say, working to uh, reduce our own uh, emission, emissions that are coming from our own operations with the target, let's say, to reduce uh, them uh, by 50% in, in, in 2030 and by, and, and let's say to go to zero by 2050. But even more important on the other side, we are investing in and working actually to develop new technologies in order to accelerate the path toward, let's say, uh, decarbonization. You will hear more from my colleague, uh, Leonardo Bardassar in a moment uh, um, about the technologies, but here we go uh, from, uh, let's say, more efficient solution in order to reduce uh, the consumption of energy on one side, then uh, we are developing uh, uh, solutions on energy storage. Uh, we are working on electrification. Uh, we are actually working on, let's say, to have a better integration of turbo machinery with uh, renewables. I mean, we are on hydrogen and we are also developing solution about carbon capture, utilization, storage. Now, I think that you might concur with me that uh, decarbonizing the world, uh, uh, and let's say not only the, the, uh, the energy sector, but I would say also the industrial sector by 2050 is a big, big challenge. I think, uh, I mean, uh, you, you probably agree with me that this is probably the most important challenge that the world is facing uh, since many years. Now, I have to say that we have some bricks today. As no opinion, for instance, uh, just to give you some numbers, I mean, we developed uh, our first reciprocating hydrogen reciprocating compressor more than 100 years ago. Actually, it was 1915 when we produced, designed and produced the first uh, hydrogen reciprocating compressor. 
Leonardo, that is uh, our actually our leader of compression, uh, could could tell you that our let's say centrifugal hydrogen centrifugal compressors have been developed in the 60s of last century. So I mean our experience is pretty pretty important. We have more than 2,500 let's say compressors today running uh, actually pumping uh, compressing hydrogen around the world. Our first uh, hydrogen 100% uh, hydrogen fuel at the gas turbine goes back. Actually, it was delivered in 2008. It was delivered in 2008. So not only, let's say, just designed. So as I said, uh, I mean, uh, we have good bricks. Let's say good elements from where to start. But in front of us, there is, uh, let's say, a big technology effort that, uh, that we need to, to do. And not only, I would say, technology only. Uh, and, and let's say, because... Uh, to make uh, the energy in the industrial sector sustainable, we will have, let's say, the need uh, to develop uh, new solutions and new technologies to develop new competencies that, to be honest, uh, we don't have yet today. In this, in this context, let's say, in, uh, in front of this important challenge, at least, uh, let's say, in our company, we are fully convinced that that to be successful, uh, we will need, uh, let's say, a strong system of collaboration among all the involved uh, players, uh, starting from the institution on one side and up to the private sector on the other side. And in this system of collaboration, the universities and the schools in general and the research centers, but the university to me are at the center of this system, uh, the university can are playing, uh, can play, let's say, a very, very important role. To win the, decar the decarbonization challenge, we will need to develop uh, new competencies and skills. And, uh, and this is where, actually, the university can make the, a big difference. I have to say that we have, uh, let's say, an historical... Uh, Actually, historically, we have been very close to the Florence University. We are talking also, let's say, a moment ago with uh, some of the professors here. Uh, the collaboration is, is strong today, was strong in the past, is strong to, uh, today. Is, I think it's a collaboration that has been uh, well lubricated through years, let's say, of uh, projects done together. Uh, but more than looking, uh, let's say, at the past, we have also to look together at the future. And that's why when I heard about uh, uh, this uh, new master with, uh, let's say, focus on sustainability, I was very pleased, to be honest. This is exactly what companies like us, we are looking. So it's exactly what an energy, a technology energy uh, company like us is looking for. So working to better prepare the engineers of tomorrow with competences that will be crucial let's say, to win uh, this battle on, uh, on energy transition uh, is probably one of the most important uh, elements, let's say, that, uh, uh, that people like me, a company like me, but the, society, the entire society, I think, are looking for. So I think, uh, and I'm going to conclude because probably I spent already uh, too much time, I think that we all uh, agree that we are living uh, a pivotal phase, uh, let's say, a, a phase of big transformation. Um, you probably also, let's say, may concur with me that uh, the, the challenge that we have in front of us, the, this transition, uh, is at a global scale. You cannot win this battle, let's say, just playing uh, in, in, in a, in a, within a country. Even within Europe, it's not enough. This battle has to be, let's say, uh, uh, done uh, globally. So you may understand that uh, scientists and engineers let's say in the f today and in the future will need to collaborate, will need to confront, and we need even to compete, let's say, on a global scale. And that's why, let's say, having a master in English, I think is a very good idea. Because, uh, let's say, doing this master's in English, even speaking today in English, let's say, brings you out of uh, our comfort zone and better prepare all of us, let's say, 
to this global confrontation that tomorrow will be of crucial importance, let's say, to, to be able actually to be successful during this energy transition that we have in front of us. Remember, confrontation, uh, let's say, with uh, different cultures, uh, confrontation with the diversity of thoughts is a good thing. I mean, uh, more ideas are good. Diversity is a value. So, I mean, uh, having the, this master delivered in English is also a value to better prepare you, let's say, to this fight and to this battle. With that, I'd like actually to thank again uh, the university to have, uh, let's say, launched uh, this uh, very good initiative. And I, also, uh, I want also to thank uh, the, in advance the students. Be, the, 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 I think the first course that is uh, actually, let's say, Indeed. Uh, I mean, um, they started uh, in these days. Um, because, I mean, uh, you have, uh, I think, uh, done uh, let's say a good selection and uh, and uh, i want to say you good luck for uh, for your future so thank you all thank you very much thank you and 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 now uh i i would like to uh introduce the next uh, speaker mr eric Ponteur. Uh, he is uh, an EU official since uh, 1994, and um, he has followed and contributed to the development of concept of sustainability within uh, the European Commission. And uh, today, he is uh, um, head of the unit uh, of the section on sustainable development of the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Grazie, Nicolo, and buongiorno a tutti. Good morning to everyone. It's uh, an immense pleasure to be addressing the Firenze University and in particular the students of the master program on mechanical engineering for sustainability. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm I'm going to be concurring largely with what has been said by the previous speakers. I'm going to build upon what they said, essentially to develop more the, uh, let's say the global, the political and the cultural aspects related to promoting sustainability. So today, what I want to do with you is to give you five reasons why sustainability is a must for you as tomorrow's managers whatever the kind of responsibility that you are going to be exercising, be it in a public or private organizations, small or large, you will need to embrace sustainability fully in your own management responsibilities. And this is what I would like to demonstrate to you today in this presentation. So these five reasons why I feel sustainability is a must are the following. First, and we have heard already a lot about this from the previous speaker, we are facing immense risk of different natures and responding to the threats, responding to the threats in anticipating management practices implies that we are taking on board sustainability considerations and approaches. That's the first point. Second point, we have an obligation we have an international obligation because we co-decided all countries, all EU, UN countries to have an agenda for sustainability aiming at 2030. This has been decided in 2015 in September in New York, and we need to commit on this agenda. Third, we are, by taking sustainability into consideration in the management practices, we are taking the precautionary measures in order to limit the risk in terms of stability, in terms of security, and in terms of resilience on the long term for organizations alone, but also for countries and regions themselves. So this is the best counter and buffer 
against risk of security and, and resilience. The fourth reason is about the social benefits. The social benefits are immense. If we are able to create with the all of society an enthusiasm for anything that relates to sustainability, like for example, the energy transition or the climate protection. And if we are making of this a collective endeavor towards more resilient and sustainable societies. Fifth, last but not least, the economic benefits, which are huge in terms of innovation. We need new technologies. We need new social innovation. And we need also to protect ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the many negative aspects of a system of economic growth, which is only directed towards the economic pillar of sustainable development. So these are the five reasons, and I will explicit one by one each of these reasons why I believe sustainability is clearly a must for you in the years to come. First, the risk. We have heard a lot about it already. Let me just say that yesterday at the opening session of the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, has had this sentence. He said, we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. We have an agreement that was decided in Paris in 2015 to mitigate climate emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, in order to not exceed 1.5 degrees C of excess of temperature by the end of this century. Unfortunately, because of many reasons, we are heading towards 2.8 degrees C. The inability of governments to decide ambitious measures, bold measures to protect the old society and to take on board the sustainability approaches and practices is one of the key reasons why we are heading towards this excessive temperature of 2.8 degrees C. Biodiversity loss, often neglected, but very key, as almost 60% of the crops that we are cultivating are depending to a certain extent on pollin pollinator insects. We are living the sixth extinction of species and nothing is done, nothing serious is done by the countries to limit this extinction. Third example of the kind of threats that we are facing, the resource overconsumption, very key for mechanical engineering. This is a business, this is a sector of activity that requires a lot of raw materials. But these raw materials, we are exhausting them at high speed. This has been evidenced by many reports and this has been set already a long time ago, 50 years ago, by the Club of Rome in 1972, in this iconic report, which is the limit to growth, which was already saying that in a world of continuous increase of the population and continuous e increase of the economic growth, inevitably, one of the consequences will be the depletion of Earth's limited resources. So we need really to be addressing this subject also with a high degree of importance. Another perspective is provided by the CEOs of large businesses in the World Economic Forum. They are also known as the Davos Forum. They are meeting every year in this posh ski resort in Switzerland. But they're also very concerned about the global risk. Each year, they're issuing a global risk report, which is based on surveys of different kinds of stakeholders. There are five risks that are being listed in the annual World Economic Forum risk report. Economic risk, environmental risk, 
geopolitical risk, societal risk, and technological risk. Without surprise, the risks that are the most considered as to be the most threatening for the livelihood of our society are of an environmental nature. You can see the green colors here. Five risks out of 10 are considered to be the most severe. Climate action failure, extreme weather, biodiversity loss, human environmental damage, natural resources crisis. Connected to, to these environmental risks, inevitably come the social risk, because of course the environmental risks are creating problems of livelihood, places that are becoming not healthy for a living, infectious diseases, livelihood crisis, and a very important issue that we are going to be dealing with in the years to come with a higher and higher intensity, which is the social cohesion erosion in our societies. We are living in more and more fragmented societies, and this is correlated to the risk of an environmental nature in particular. And you can see that at the bottom of the list, we have an economic risk, death crisis, inevitably, think of COVID and the public money which has been poured to salvage the societies, and the geo geoeconomic and geopolitical risk that are going to become much more important in next year assessment due in particular to the war in Ukraine. Why have I been spotting to the World Economic Forum report? Simply to tell you that the business sector, the big corporates are becoming increasingly aware and concerned about the environmental and social risks that are faced by the whole of society. It is limiting potentially, if we are not acting decisively, their capacity for developing new business. So we need to be taking these sustainability considerations into mind and to embrace them into the decision making at each level of the society. I will skip this one, just not to spend too much time on this and move to the second reason. Second reason, as I said, we have an, we have an agenda on sustainable development. It has been decided in 2015 at the UN. All countries of the UN subscribe to this agenda. It's an agenda for sustainability, but it's also an agenda for peace and security. We have a strong social component that can be easily, uh, let's say, understood via the social motto, which is leaving no one behind. The 17 goals of the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda are very diverse. They are concerning the three pillars of sustainable development, social, economic, and environmental. In relation to mechanical engineering, let me spot three SDGs that are of prime concern to the business in mechanical engineering. There is, of course, the SDG 8, decent work and economic growth, but also the SDG 9, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And also the SDG 12, responsible consumption and production. And if you look beyond the business itself, you have to look at the consequences and the impacts of the business, like climate action, SDG 13, the environmental risk, SDG 14, 15. And I wouldn't like to miss SDG 17 on partnerships for the goals, because this is an SDG which is key for exactly doing what the previous speaker said cooperating with others, developing cooperative approach, not only at company level, but also at country level and the, at the international level. This is one of the key recipes for putting in place meaningful sustainability measures. As I said, three pillars, economic society and environment, but also the agenda cares for the institutional pillar. We need to be placing 
good sustainability measures and approaches at each level of the society, from the country level down to the regional level, the city level, the town level, but also the community level at the level of neighborhood and small communities, which are very active in order to promote sustainability at the local level. The three pillars that are very often known as the three main ones have to be also facing and undergoing, let's say, practices that are respecting key principles like integration. This was also said by the previous speakers. We need to be putting together in a consistent manner the different sectors of activities. Mechanical engineering, of course, has to tie in with other sectors of the activity outside, within the same country, outside the country, internationally. Universality is also a key value of the SDGs. These SDGs, the 17 SDGs, are applicable to all countries, not only the developing countries, as it was the case for the Millennium Development Goals. Here, it is applicable to all. And last but not least, but I said it already, participation is key. Without creating a sense of collective effort, we will not be able to succeed. Let me now move to the positive impacts that could be generated if we are taking up sustainability in the right way at organizational and country level. First, reason to believe strongly into sustainability is the capacity of creating resilient and secure system in the long term. It's not a 100% guarantee, but it's a safeguard. It's a buffer. Let me take a counter example, the example of the war in Ukraine. The situation was somehow predictable. Annexation of Crimea in 2014 and or heavy EU dependence on Russian natural gas that we have co-created with the Russians. We have just decided to buy natural gas in Russia because it was cheaper compared to other sources of supply that were available to us. So we are responsible for having created this dependency to a certain extent. Now that the war has started and the consequences of the war are evident and are affecting each and every actor of the society, we have to live with a high energy price, which is impacting the old economy, and in particular, the manufacturing sector, a high inflation, which is putting at risk the social cohesion and the economic development. And we are forced to take measures that we don't like to take, just to buffer, just to protect citizens and companies, like returning temporarily to the use of coal or creating new dependencies with other gas suppliers like US or Quetta for the LNG. All this is going in the right direction? No. It's our fault partly not to have anticipated that this dependency on Russian natural gas was wrong. And let's be clear, this has happened in the region of the world which is the most advanced with regard to climate protection. The EU is often claiming itself to be the world leader in terms of climate protection. And yet, we haven't been able to secure policies and measures that would have protected us against this heavy dependence on fossil fuels. This is part of our responsibility. We haven't been looking at the long term. We haven't been putting in place the bold measures that were necessary to put in place. Moving now to the fourth reason, the social benefits. Very important to take these on board. We have seen the risk of creating a society which is increasingly fragmented between the ones who are wealthy and the others. 
is very huge. It's for me the number one risk. We need really to be thinking very clearly about the consequences of the transformation that we want to apply. We have been talking before of the green transition, the emerging transition, all good. But we have to be aware that these kind of transitions are going to lead to winners on the one hand, but also losers on the, the, the other hand. And there will be a fair share of losers in the society. We need to be providing to the most vulnerable ones opportunities, conditions for acceding to a situation where they could gain from the transition. They need to have a fair access to the collective benefits. Otherwise, we risk to have similar situations like France experienced some three years ago with the yellow vest. Another very important aspect of it is that if we want to succeed in the long run, because an energy transition or the climate protection are efforts that are going to have to remain in place and to stay for decades. It's a long term engagement. If we want really to have a collective engagement effort towards climate protection or energy transition, we need to create conditions for a whole of society approach. We need to have each and every one playing a role. This is essential because this transformation will imply inevitably important changes on the way we consume and on the way we live. This has to be well understood by all of us. The fifth reason is an economic one. There are many benefits, of course, and societies, businesses know that investing into sustainability approaches, products, services is almost a guarantee of being profitable on the market. New technologies have to be developed. What is clear from the ESG, um, let's say, criteria is that the companies who are investing into SDGs do generally perform better compared to their competitors. And let me open another perspective. By using the SDGs as a backbone for the decision making, for designing new solutions, new products, for implementing these solutions and projects, we are opening a new cultural perspective of moving away from an exclusive focus on economic growth. This has been the way countries have been piloted since the 50s, since the 60s. A focus on the GDP and only on the GDP. Yet, at the academic level, at university level, there's been a lot of research on moving beyond the GDP, but nothing has been done really to advance this kind of transformation. The SDGs, with what they mean, what they imply, are offering a possibility to rethink and reimagine the transformation of the economic system. I think this is an opportunity that has to be considered. Conclusions. I think we have insisted very much today on the consequences of our way of living, dramatic consequences. Sustainability is clearly not a goal which is pursued with the right level of intensity by the countries. We are facing a world of a overlapping crisis. They're already there, climate, biodiversity. And for me, the main concern that I have as a citizen is that the social tipping point will be hit very soon. If we are not careful enough to increase the cohesion of our society, to protect the most vulnerable, we will not be able to face the necessary transition towards a cleaner and more sustainable society. Now, the hopes that I have is that by taking sustainability into consideration and using it 
to focus and steer decision at each and every level, organizations, private or public, but also country level, governmental level. We are taking a high, let's say, protection for ourselves. We are putting in place, let's say, conditions that are highly protective against future shocks. And for me, this is an absolute way to go to mainstream sustainability and sustainability agenda into each and every organizations. For the master on mechanical engineering for sustainability, this is offering a great assets to students as it is providing a unique opportunity to reinvent an old sector of activity, if I may say so, and trying to revitalize, to reinvent this sector of activity with new ideas, new approaches, new practices to enhance its pro profitability in the future, but also enhance the profitability while minimizing the negative externalities onto the old society. Things like eco-design, resource efficient production means, sustainable sourcing, due diligence across the supply chain are among the sustainable sustainability challenges that have to be addressed by the European mechanical engineering sector to enhance its business opportunities on the international market. And I'm truly convinced that this master program is going to be one of the drivers to make this transformation possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Eric, uh, thank you very much for your presentation, for your motivational speech, uh, uh, which really uh, touched the uh, important uh, societal and ethical aspects that are behind uh, the revolution that uh, we, we will face in the next years and that we are already still living. Hopefully, it, it, will, it will deliver uh, tangible results uh, for, for the entire world. Thank you very much for your words, and thank you very much for uh, squeezing this presentation uh, within uh, your several commitments. I know that you, you have uh, to leave shortly, so thanks again for, for this. Bye-bye. So, um, uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the next uh, speaker. Uh, Mr. Leonardo Baldassare, when uh, uh, previously um, we, um, we spoke about cooperation of the University of Florence with uh, Nuovo Pignone, uh, indeed uh, he is one <laughs> of, the, of the key elements uh, in the sense uh, that, uh, sorry. Um, that he studied uh, at uh, the uh, University of, um, of Florence, and uh, he started then his, his career um, at uh, uh, Enel uh, Research and Development Center, and then uh, he shortly, shortly after he joined uh, uh, Novo Pignone, G, G Oil and Gas at the time, and since then he covered uh, several roles, and today he is executive LDR engineering. So, um, just a few seconds, and I will uh, uh, take uh, the presentation and share with uh, the online audience. So, that's, that's it. And okay. now the floor is yours. First of all, thank you uh, for having invited me to this uh, opening. I think uh, personally, I'm very happy to be here and to, to talk about this subject. Uh, and also, I think it's a great opportunity to share what uh, we are doing as a company. Paolo was touching at the beginning uh, uh, what is the direction of the company, of our company, Behayux uh, Nuovo Pignone. And uh, I will uh, try to go a bit, not too much, but a bit more in detail of uh, where we are looking for. Maybe if we can move to the next slide, please. First of all, a uh, few numbers uh, of our company. Yeah, we wait for that. Uh, 
Okay. Okay, so basically, you see the main number. Um, as Paulo was saying, we are present in more than 120 countries around the world. We have more than 54,000 employees around the world, and many of them are engineers, by the way. Then um, revenue have been 20.5 billion in a year, and we have the aim to grow. We have, we have been developing our technology through patents. You see the number of patents that we have been doing, and we want to do more. And uh, the period we are working and we are living of energy transition is getting more and more challenges and more and more opportunity of uh, creating patents. Patents is the pillar of a company. If you want to, to have a solid company, you need to have patents. This is your intellectual property that is one of the most important area and the most important pillar that you do have together with the people. So if you go to the next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> what are our pillars? You see, we have oil field services. Clearly, the company has been built around the oil and gas, as we were saying before, and now is transitioning more and more toward the energy transition. So a more sustainable use of the energy resources. Then we have oil field equipment, digital solution. Digital means all the activity you can do to optimize the way you are working, the way you are using the resources also. And then turbo machinery. Maybe if we go to the next slide, turbo machinery for us means many things. So uh, we range from products, uh, compressors, uh, uh, centrifugal reciprocating compressors, uh, gas turbines, electric motors, uh, expanders, steam turbines, uh, valves, uh, whatever you want, whatever we do. And then solutions, let's say the way we use uh, these parts, I mean, these components uh, to create uh, something that is working and uh, can work reliably and can work uh, in a clean way even in the future. And uh, these are the fillers, as uh, Paolo was uh, uh, <clears throat> talking before, are the fillers where we are building our future. For example, if you think to energy transition, in many energy transition applications, you need to move fluids. So you still need to have compressors, either reciprocating, either centrifugal. You still need to have something that is generating power, so gas turbine. Maybe in the past we were used to to, to feed with uh, natural gas or with oil. Tomorrow we we'll need to feed more and more with, uh, with hydrogen, etc. But at the end, there is also the way we interact with the environment and how we integrate this machinery inside the, the plants that can make the difference. I don't want to spend too much time, but only to give you a flavor uh, <clears throat> of what we are doing. Now, where we are committed today, these are some areas where we are committed and we are looking and we are even starting to do business in these areas. So we have some main pillars. One is carbon capture and sequestration. And it's quite important because um, clearly uh, there is the need, uh, as we were reading also before, there is the need to continue to use for a while, for example, of the natural, the natural gas. The way we need to use clearly needs to, to think also uh, to reduce the emission from the natural gas. Maybe till now we have been using, we have been burning natural gas and emitting the natural gas to the atmosphere. Tomorrow and today, basically we are developing solution in order, first of all, to capture the, natural the CO2 from the natural gas, and then maybe to inject this natural gas in some ways, in order to avoid to release this to the atmosphere. And we are developing technology in this, in this space, and maybe I will talk more about the way we are developing this technology. Then another important area is the hydrogen. You know, <clears throat> hydrogen is a clean fuel, if you want at least the end part of the hydrogen is a clean fuel. 
because at the end is H2, when you burn H2, you produce uh, uh, energy and uh, uh, water at the end. So uh, you have no pollution, basically. Clearly, the way you produce hydrogen can make the difference. I will, I will have a slide to, to make uh, and to, to understand better what, does it, what it means. Then uh, energy storage, another important uh, area of development uh, is the way we store energy because uh, all of us, we want to go in the direction of renewable, renewable sources. Here, all of us, we like sun. I've recently installed it of my uh, ceiling, I mean, the uh, solar panels. But clearly, this, uh, um, you can put the battery, and this is a way uh, where you can accumulate energy. But in, in some period of the time, you cannot use these uh, renewable sources, either uh, so, sun, either wind, etc. So you need to have ways that can accumulate, uh, can accumulate energy. It can be batteries, it can be even KS, compressed air energy storage, LIES, liquid air energy storage. It can be CO2 in several form, let's see. But at the end, you need to have something that is able to provide you with energy, maybe during the night, during when it's raining, where there is no wind. And it's important to develop all this technology. It's not a given. So it's important to put brain, to put focus, and to understand what are the challenges. And then another important area is the flaring. What I was saying before, maybe in the past we were flaring gas, even from compressors or other machinery. Today we don't want to do it more. So at the end we need to have vent recovery system that are taking the gas, maybe are cleaning up in some ways, or are simply injecting back to the machinery. So it's important to work on, il, on all these areas, because each of them has a contribute to the, to the missions at the end. This is the hydrogen value chain, and I go from the left to the right. Hydrogen production. You can produce hydrogen from many sources. You can start from uh, sun, so solar panels, then uh, you have electrolyzers. From the electrolyzers, uh, you start from water and you produce hydrogen. And this is called the, the green hydrogen because you start from renewable. You can produce uh, hydrogen even from uh, methane. And uh, in that case, uh, clearly you produce, uh, sooner or later you produce CO2. If uh, this CO2 is injected or is not any, in any case emitted to the environment, we talk about blue hydrogen. If it is emitted in some way, is brown, I mean, um, brown hydrogen is not the blue hydrogen, I would say. In any case, in order, when you produce hydrogen, you need to move this hydrogen through compressors. So there are machinery associated to this, normally driven by electric motor. Think about solar panels, electrolyzers, batteries, electric motor driven compressor, all is around electricity and all is around a different way of moving this machinery. Clearly, sooner or later you need some turbine or some steam or gas turbine because you need to produce this electricity. It's not enough from the sun, but at the end there will be a lot of push also around electrification. Once you have produced this hydrogen, normally it's in the range of 30 bar, 35 bar, you need to move this vector, let's say. So you need to transport. If you decide to transport through simple hydrogen, it's quite complex because hydrogen is embrittled in the metallic material. It's creating many challenges that you'll be faced to, to work on, and we are doing a lot of R&D activity in that area. Normally, the, the main areas that uh, the industry is looking for is uh, through ammonia or a blend of natural gas. You have to use uh, the existing network. Finally, you transport, you bring to the utilization area, or maybe you can liquefy in order to transport uh, all around the world through uh, ships. Or um, you, you can liquefy, you transport it, or you transport uh, in a liquefied format, the, the ammonia, 
and then by pyrolysis in the port where you receive, you transfer back in hydrogen. Then we can discuss about the sustainability of all this transformation, but everything is starting from green. And finally, at least for now, till now, this source of energy is free, let's say, and it is not finishing. And then we have the refueling station. So just to tell you, only this space where we are doing already business in that area is plenty of machinery, is plenty of engineering challenges, and is calling many talents. Maybe if we go to, to the next slide, this is the key part of my presentation because everything is starting and ending with talents. At the end, is um, it's very good that we are opening this kind of course here, in particular in Florence. We have been doing many activities, as Paolo was mentioning before, in particular with the University of Florence, but not only. University of Florence is a key part of our company. We have very tight relation, either in terms of R&D activity, either in terms of talent injection. I'm not a talent, but they have been injected there. And, uh, it's important, and it's important today. This is in mechanical engineering, but my recommendation is to be broad. And then the, you saw several areas, and we range from uh, electrolyzer to mechanical engineering aspect, very high speed machinery, maybe um, a hydrogen embrittlement, so materials. There are many ingredients today. Tomorrow, we don't know what is needed. So the important thing is to be open and to be ready to accept new challenges, even in areas that you have not been exploring. You take books, you start studying, you go to conference, you meet customers, you meet people, and at the end they will get ready for next challenges. So today you are studying a part, is the starting point, tomorrow you need to continue to study. The important point is to be curious and to continue to learn. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your perspective in, uh, in the turbine machinery sector. Uh, I know that uh, there are some, some students that have already uh, chosen the uh, curriculum on energy technologies. So, so I, I hope that tomorrow, in the future they, they will come to, to you to to build all of this together. And we need them. Thank you very much. <laughs> so um, now we, uh, we change a sector. We go to the automotive sector. And uh, I, I would like to, to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, David Storer. David Storer is, is a mechanical engineer as well. He studied in Southampton and got his PhD in, in Manchester. And uh, I met him when he worked uh, at the uh, Fiat Research Center. He, he worked uh, there for 28 years before moving uh, to, to CLEPA. Uh, and, and now uh, CLEPA is uh, the, the European uh, Association of Automotive Suppliers, and uh, he is uh, the um, uh, director of research there. So uh, he will give us a, a good perspective in this new sector. So, David. Yes, thank you. Let me just share my presentation with you. I see it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today, albeit remotely, um, and talk to you um, about the growing relevance of sustainability in the automotive industry. So thank you very much to the previous speakers for really highlighting the importance of sustainability in general for our society. Um, you know, today I'm not going to talk in general terms, I'm going to focus a little bit more about the automotive industry and about the challenges we're facing there. Um, just as a way of introduction, CLEPA, the association that I represent, the European Association of Automotive Suppliers, is really um, quite important in the automotive industry because we represent all of the supply chain and we have really thousands of companies across Europe in the automotive supply chain. Um, 
and yeah, it's really important also to highlight the fact that there's a tremendous investment in research and innovation in this sector. Um, and the suppliers are very much part of that. Often we think of the vehicle manufacturers, but behind the vehicle manufacturers, you have this whole supply chain. And we, you know, we're very, um, how can I say, enthusiastic about the opportunity to also contribute um, to this question of sustainable development, very often uh, in direct collaboration with the vehicle manufacturers and indeed other stakeholders uh, involved in this challenge. So, yeah, as I say, it's a very important sector, uh, particularly in terms of the jobs uh, and employment and also the investment that we have uh, in research and development. Uh, very, very important for Europe in general. Uh, and CLEPA covers um, all of this sector. Indeed, if we think of the average vehicle that comprises over 30,000 parts, you can understand the role and the, the reason why perhaps there are so many suppliers uh, involved in this industry. Now, the challenges we're facing are very clear for us all. Um, very often, the automotive industry, along with other providers of mobility solutions, such as the aerospace industry, today we, we are portrayed as perhaps being the bad guys. Um, and of course, in a way, that's the case. But a lot of work is being done today um, across the sectors, across the mobility sectors, to improve um, the, the sustainability uh, of our vehicles, the circularity of our vehicles. And of course, we're all engineers, you know, we're in this together. We need to find solutions. We understand the problems, but I think, you know, with your choice of mechanical engineer for sustainability, what you're doing is you're also uh, indicating that you're willing to help find the solutions to these uh, incredible problems that we face today uh, in terms of sustainability, sustainable, sustainable development, and in general, the impact on the environment. So when we talk about sustainability, one immediately thinks of the environmental perspective, in terms of emissions, energy usage, waste, and, and the consumption of water. Um, but there are other aspects as well, as some of the other speakers have touched on as well. So there's a social aspect as well, looking at diversity and inclusion, for example, health and safety. In particular, education and development, that's really important to everything we do. Uh, and then there's also the governance aspect you know, how we manage this and how we guarantee safety and quality and how we are also uh, able to include the customer, include the users in what we do and make sure the users are satisfied at the end of the day. Um, it's, it's all very important, very, very important to have this inclusion also uh, from the user side. Uh, and that's a bit of a challenge for us because it represents something of a change with the, let's say, business as usual, how we've developed products in the past. You know, today, increasingly, we need to find a way to really engage with the user and understand their needs, uh, not only in terms of sustainability, but in, in all aspects as well. Uh, and this is going to drive forward, certainly the development process in our industry and indeed in all industries. Uh, just looking specifically at the automotive sector, um, this is a bit of a, a busy graph. I don't really expect to go into detail here. The, the key message here is that we need to look at all aspects of the development and design of a product and how that product is used in terms of its impact on the environment. So very often now in the sector, we talk about the life cycle analysis of a vehicle. Um, if we look now at the life cycle analysis of an electric car, this is what this graph is demonstrating here. Now, what we have to understand is there's an impact in terms of emissions from all parts of the process, right from cradle to grave, right to the end of life of the vehicle. Um, incidentally, um, one of the leaders in the LCA of vehicles in the automotive domain in Europe is the Department of uh, Industrial Engineering at the University of Florence. It's really well known across Europe, particularly the automotive industry, as being one of the, let's say, the lead as one of the uh, reference points for LCA of vehicles in general. But I think the key message is here that it's, it's a process that involves many different stakeholders right across the chain. And again, the message is that we're all in this together. 
So if we look specifically at battery electric vehicles, so when we hear talk about the future of the industry and how it's going to become more sustainable, there's very often reference today towards battery electric vehicles. Um, and it seems like this is a silver bullet. This is going to solve all of our problems. Let me just say that, at least from our perspective, there's a lot of work, a lot of engineering work that still needs to be done in terms of battery electric vehicles, and in particular, the battery itself. Now, here on the right, you see just a few images of battery systems. The battery system obviously consists of a number of cells, many cells very often, but these are just components in a, in a wider system that includes also uh, solutions for the thermal management of the battery cells, the mechanical integrity, let's say, of the system, and also, of course, the electric and electronic control part of the system. So when we look at a, a full battery system, we're talking about a complex system that very often weighs several hundred kilos as well. So it's a, a big, heavy system that we need to really uh, optimize in terms of its engineering uh, performance. So as I say, with the growing demand for battery electric vehicles, there's the environmental impact of the extraction and processing of the raw materials is really important, expected to grow. And of course, we need to look at how the, the batteries themselves are produced in terms of the energy, because there's a lot of energy actually absorbed in the production of batteries as, as well. And, and look at the sustainable materials, make sure the materials used are ethically sourced and are recyclable. Um, but in Europe, of course, you know, we, we're not sufficient or self-sufficient yet in terms of the production of battery cells. Uh, we're still looking to the Far East for the production of batteries. Now, Europe is trying to catch up here. But in a way, uh, our hands, to some extent, are tied, at least for the current uh, chemistries of batteries, because the Far East is far and away the biggest producer of battery cells uh, today. But nevertheless, we need to really focus on how, what we can do in terms of battery recycling, how we can design these battery systems to be recycled uh, and really make sure that we do everything we can possibly do to ensure that these systems are circular. Um, and this also involves uh, ensuring that the, not only the manufacturing and the use of these battery systems, but the whole management of these battery systems in some way is taken care of because we will need to ensure that they don't kind of get lost in the system or or, or get let's say transferred to other countries we need to um, manage the process in such a way that we can at the end of the life bring them back and then recycle them and this is really important also for the raw materials uh, because raw materials obviously it's a critical aspect there's a, a limited supply we need to make sure that the recycling process is going to generate, give us back the materials that we need for new battery systems in the future. Um, and also, as you probably hear a lot of talk about the second life of automotive batteries, how automotive batteries, once they've been used in the, in, the, in the vehicle, can then be used again for a second life for, let's say, the storage of electrical energy, particularly for renewable sources, because the generation of renewable electricity is often intermittent, and so there's a lot of talk today about the second life of automotive batteries. In a way, this is conflicting to some extent with the recycling of batteries, but we'll wait to see you know, if this second life of automotive batteries really does become an important application uh, for, for, for automotive batteries in the future. And of course, there are other considerations that need to be taken into account when we look at batteries. So basically the message here is there's a lot of engineering still needs to be done uh, for battery electric vehicles, particularly in terms of the optimization and design for recycling of the battery system. Now, another point I just want to quickly uh, mention is also the question of material selection for the vehicle, and in particular, the use of plastics on cars and vehicles. Um, a tremendous amount of the vehicle is already uh, reused or recycled, about 90%, according to statistics in 2019. But uh, most of that is the metals. Instead, the plastic is usually disposed of in some way or downcycled. So again, a lot of work still needs to be done in terms of how we manage the materials on vehicles, in particular the plastics. 
Uh, also because plastics are forecast to uh, take a greater share of the vehicle in the future, uh, as we try to move towards new types of vehicles, smaller vehicles perhaps for the urban applications, which need to be lighter as well. And so it's tempting to use uh, a greater share of plastic also uh, from that perspective. Um, but the end of life vehicle directive, which is being put forward by the European Commission and is due uh, very soon next year, uh, is expected to raise the need to have more recycled content uh, in vehicles and in particular plastic. So it absolutely there's this drive to make to making the vehicles, the selection of the materials in the vehicles also as circular as possible. Um, now this is a generic image that I'm sure you've seen many times about the circular economy. It doesn't only apply to the vehicle industry, the automotive industry, it applies to all industries. Uh, but of course, the automotive industry is very much, let's say, in the eye of the hurricane here, uh, in terms of needing to become uh, as circular as possible in terms of uh, raw materials, production processes, but also the management of the waste, really trying to reduce or eliminate waste uh, as much as possible. Um, and in this circular economy approach, in my, uh, from my perspective, uh, there's an absolute need to look at renewable materials, re materials from renewable, renewable sources, and in particular, uh, look more closely at the possibility to use bioplastics. Now, there's a lot of work that's been done uh, already in this area by different vehicle manufacturers and suppliers. Uh, but let's say most of it is uh, still at the level of prototypes and demonstrators. Uh, we still need to take that leap into bringing in these new concepts and new materials into the mass production of vehicles. Uh, and again, um, the, you know, we need engineers, we need mechanical engineers that are really focused on sustainability to, to address these challenges, very concrete challenges, and we need to move very, very quickly on this. So in summary, I think it's very clear um, that the impact on the environment and ensuring sustainable development is extremely important. It's probably the most important challenge that's facing the human race today. Um, a lot of discussion obviously is taking place in these days in COP27. Um, but what we need is to perhaps move beyond the great speeches and understanding uh, the importance of the situation to actually finding solutions. Uh, and that's you know, what we are trying to do. That's what we're doing in the automotive industry. And that's why we need uh, more mechanical engineers that really uh, are focusing on sustainability. And, and you know, the, the educational uh, aspect is so important because today there is a lack of technical expertise. There's an absolute urgent need for specialized education programs and training programs, exactly like the one which is being set up now in the Department of Industrial Engineering at the University of Florence. So, uh, yeah, as graduates of the Mechanical Engineer for Sustainability Program at the University of Florence, you have a huge opportunity, a tremendous opportunity to become true pioneers in this field. Um, and, you know, it's rapidly becoming of overwhelming importance. And CLIPA is absolutely uh, very proud and happy to be able to endorse this Mechanical Engineering Program. Um, and yes, I salute you. I commend your, your choice uh, for this program. So thank you very much indeed. And if anybody has any questions or would like to contact me in future, there is my email address. Thank you. Thank you, David, for your perspective in the automotive area. And uh, indeed, uh, when we will uh, have the traineeship <coughs> of the second year, I think uh, we could have uh, a, a good uh, partnership uh, if uh, our students would like to uh, to develop the international uh, dimension and, and go abroad uh, for the traineeship and, and thesis. In the case, uh, I will bother you uh, asking for, for connections. Absolutely. I look forward to that, honestly. Uh, as soon as you, we have some graduates coming through, please come back to me. Anybody who's interested in working in the automotive industry, certainly uh, I can provide many contacts there and we'd be happy to help. Okay, thanks again. Thanks again for 
for your speech. So now, uh, uh, two minutes uh, um, um, technical pause. Uh, we load uh, the, um, the last technical presentation uh, before I, I go to uh, say a, a few words uh, about uh, uh, the, the master. So in, in the meanwhile, I invite uh, the last speaker, Matteo Mantellassi. Yeah, please <laughs> take a seat here, and I will uh, look for the for the presentation. Yeah, uh, uh, Matteo he studied business business and management economics at the University of Florence and. Uh, he is a principal chief executive officer at the Manteco. Yes. Um, I'm, thank you, everybody, for inviting me here and sharing uh, uh, our experience uh, uh, in our business. We are a textile uh, company uh, born uh, in 1941, and the, the, the company started in 1943. We are the third gen I'm the third generation and I'm a co-CEO with uh, together with my brother Marco of uh, Manteco, uh, which uh, I introduce a little bit. We uh, we are the third generation. My uh, grandfather was a, a pioneer in sustainability because he started recycling uh, uh, old uh, blankets uh, coming from uh, uh, military garments. So uh, he he didn't have so much money. So uh, at that time, uh, in 1941, there was no uh, possibility to have uh, materials coming from uh, uh, from far away because of the Second World War. So uh, he thought that um, he, he thought to to use something that was already existing. So he went to close a small town close to Naples, and he he bought some blankets uh, that he started uh, with many many trials uh, to recycle into a new. A new fabric uh, that he was uh, then he started to sell uh, these fabrics uh, and they i mean this was uh, the beginning uh, of uh, our history and uh, so in the beginning of uh, 2000 me and my my brother uh, when everybody was going uh, uh, to produce fabrics uh, all over the world we we did uh, the opposite choice to to produce everything in italy and to uh, to make our uh, recycled wool uh, something that uh, uh, was uh, going into the luxury, into something, because at that time uh, the, the recycled wool was uh, uh, a very poor uh, fabric that was uh, used uh, uh, only uh, when uh, you didn't achieve the price uh, with the virgin wool. So we did uh, the opposite thinking, so we, we thought that uh, our uh, uh, our history was uh, something that was uh, uh, coming from the, our DNA and was something that we, we should uh, take as an opportunity to develop something that nobody has was done uh, before. So uh, we start, uh, um, you know, the, the, the textile has a very diff different steps uh, from the raw material uh, to the final uh, fabric and to the final garments. Uh, so we start little by little to to make uh, we, we recycle pre and post consumer uh, uh, garments and uh, fabrics. So uh, we we start selecting uh, and uh, taking uh, um, uh, some connection with especially with the American uh, market where where the culture of throwing away garments was uh, uh, more ahead than here. So. Uh, we we take we 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 take uh, some connection with uh, some organization in the United States, and we 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 try to to make uh, um, a new business model. No, where uh, uh, from the collection of an old material, uh, we we could uh, achieve into a new and uh, transparent uh, new uh, luxury uh, recycled wool uh, fabric. Um, so I mean the, this step. Uh, uh, we took almost uh, 20 years uh, uh, to achieve uh, the top of uh, of the fabric that uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm here to to share because uh, uh, we we are doing now uh, more than 1,000 colors. Uh, uh, now you, you can 
go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, this is a little introduction of the history that we already, uh, already talked. Um, so the, the, um, uh, we started uh, uh, to start, I mean, there was a lot of uh, luxury brands that believe in our work and we, they, they need also our fabric because uh, uh, now they, want, they, they need to, to use materials that are, are uh, much more sustainable. Um, and what was also important, it was innovation that we have done into the process. Uh, but also in how we study the impact of our uh, fabric. Uh, because um, until uh, uh, Manteco started, uh, there was not uh, scientific data, there was not uh, uh, innovation in the process of uh, recycling. Uh, so uh, we have done a, a really an important for work for all the fashion, uh, fashion business. Uh, we are here uh, situated in Prato, so not far, far away from here. And we work uh, uh, with around 40 uh, of the main university of uh, uh, fashion university, where we teach uh, uh, the eco design to the new uh, to the new designers that will be bring uh, uh, the eco design uh, in, into the future. So, um, because education for us is uh, the most important thing. Uh, when you do something, you, you project something, uh, you, you need always to think uh, not only, um, so you have a great opportunity now because there is a field that, that, uh, um, that, that, that has been uh, untouched for, uh, for many, many years, a field where you need to think about uh, uh, CO2, so how the redu reduction of CO2, the reduction of water, the reduction of energy. Um, and uh, for example, our design of our textile design that are in uh, Manteco, uh, it's um, already more than 15 years that they de develop uh, beautiful fabrics, but only not only with the beauty inside, but uh, uh, with a lot of echo, uh, echo uh, things uh, inside the, the fabrics. For example, the fabric has to be recyclable, so all our fabric are recyclable, or our fabric uh, uh, are made uh, to be uh, to last uh, as long as possible. So, so the durability is uh, is very important. Uh, and also the fabric uh, has to use materials that uh, um, are, uh, have scientific data that uh, uh, prove that uh, are uh, less uh, impact than, uh, uh, than other materials, compared materials. Um, so, but the designers, that they, the, the textile designers, they, um, they thank us uh, um, uh, because uh, of this, because, you know, uh, developing something only which is beautiful is not enough now. And they, uh, when they develop the new fabrics, they, uh, they feel uh, much more uh, um, glory to design this kind of fabric. So um, you can go ahead. Um, this is, uh, we are part of Ellen McCartan Foundation, which we are the only textile uh, uh, mill uh, um, that is producing fabric uh, that part of Ellen McCartan Foundation is very important in the fashion business because uh, um, Ellen McCartan is, um, a, a, was, she was a sailor, she, she was the, the first uh, to do the, the, the tour of the world with the, the boat, of a sailing boat. When she came back, she, she stopped everything and she said, I need to create a foundation uh, for circularity because uh, uh, our ocean are full of plastic, are full of, uh, of shit. So I need to, to do something. I, I need to stop uh, this uh, development. So she, she started this foundation. Now all the big brands uh, and uh, ourselves are part of this foundation. And we, uh, every one time uh, per month, we, we uh, organize a meeting and we, I mean, you know, fashion has to, to build a new business model. We cannot go on like this uh, and we, we need to, to really move forward uh, uh, very, very quickly. Um, so we, are, we work with uh, Bocconi, for example, with, uh, together uh, with, uh, with the economic part. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we are really forward on, on all the, our steps. We can go ahead. This is our M wool is the, the brand name of our wood that we produce is coming from a, a circular economy. So it's a recycled wool. We go from 100% uh, wool to 100% cashmere. Uh, so it's um, uh, it's a really a step forward uh, of our uh, industry. 
um, you can go ahead. Okay, these are uh, all our uh, colors. We produce, uh, these colors are produced with our recipe process. So we don't use any kind of water, any kind of, uh, uh, only electricity and mechanically. Uh, because we, you know, we, we recuperate uh, old garments which are already colored. So we, uh, we mix together uh, different colors, like uh, a painter, no? They mix uh, together different colors to do a new color. So the impact of this, uh, um, you can go on, this is uh, the process that we do in our company. We have a, a circular economy lab where we study all our colors, all, our, all the materials that we need to, to recover. Uh, these are the, the colors that uh, is blending uh, in our machine. Okay, um, uh, so uh, you can go ahead. Also, uh, this is the, are the impact uh, uh, of. Uh, so you can see minus ninety nine percent because you know the the, the wool is a, a material that uh, is very high impact. If you start from the ground, if you start from the animal. Until the end, um, the life circle assessment (LCA) is uh, is very impact, but it's a material that can be recycled many many times. So we are uh, also from this part we are uh, working with with the scientists uh, to make them understand that the calculation that is done now is not enough. We need to calculate the durability of the product. We need to calculate uh, the recyclability of the product. Uh, and we are uh, working together uh, to um, to make uh, um, an important, uh, uh, you know, before there was uh, uh, the, the, the automotive uh, um, uh, business, no, that was, uh, I don't remember, David uh, was yes. explaining, yes. Uh, and this is very curious because uh, we, we talk uh, more or less uh, uh, the same language in, the, in this moment because we work uh, Really, with uh, with data, we are working with uh, a lot of analysis. Um, yesterday, I was presenting this material in Ferrari because we we, we did 100% uh, wool, uh, the most durable 100% uh, wool of the world, and uh, they need to change materials inside the, the the cars, and they they tried our materials and they pass all the 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 um, uh, they prove the, the test. Uh, so um, I was discussing with them uh, some opportunity, and this was incredible. Uh, if uh, I was thinking uh, even two or three years ago, so we are really giving uh, uh, a turning point to to do our business. Uh, you mentioned the wool is also um, uh, bio biodegradable. Uh, there is no microplastic coming out from. Uh, uh, it's fire uh, uh, is unbelievable fire resistant uh, so has uh, uh, you know of course the petrol has changed uh, in the last 15 years uh, all the business uh, because uh, polyester or nylon it cost uh, much less than wool uh, but uh, the opportunity that uh, the, 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 uh, our uh, our world is giving our planet is giving uh, is big so um, we are trying okay you can you can go on these are all the impact. Uh, environmental impact. We, we, we have done LCA and EPD, environmental uh, product degradation um, from uh, with the University of Turin. We use a lot of university, we cooperate a lot with university. We, now we are working with Leeds uh, University for uh, uh, to experiment our materials uh, in terms of uh, uh, more physical uh, tests. Uh, so we are really going deeply in, into innovation, okay? Um, okay, our production, this is very interesting also for you, our production is zero waste, so what we waste is reintroduced in, in, internally into, um, into the, the, the materials, the raw materials uh, to, to be produced, so we are zero waste, uh, we have zero waste production. Uh, this is the starting point of our uh, um, uh, project uh, of uh, um, circularity. Then you can you can go on. These are all the process where we are uh, taking back uh, from scraps, uh, uh, scraps from from spinning, from uh, coning, uh, warping. Uh, uh, is, uh, uh, to make a fabric is a long process. It seems easy, but it's very very long uh, process. And in each process, we are uh, um, we have a, a group of people that. Uh, they, they take back uh, uh, the, the, the scrub of, of, of this process and we take back uh, in the, into a new into new material. Okay. Um, 
this is the sustainable design that I was thinking, uh, uh, talking before. Is uh, you know our designers they uh, they really designing uh, into innovation, not only beauty, because for us beauty is the the key factor of cho choosing a fabric, but is also working durability and uh, recyclability. Okay, we can go on. Um, yes, this is the, what we could uh, recuperate uh, from 4% to 20% of the fabric uh, is usually wasted uh, during manufacturing process. And so we, we developed this new uh, project, which are, uh, you, can, you can, can, can go on. This is project 43, where uh, we have uh, a logistic that is going into the old uh, garment makers. Uh, to recuperate all the scraps during the um, when they produ when they produce the garments they cut the fabric and all the scraps they come out, uh, they that come out they are uh, uh, recovered by by us and taken back especially because this the, the the fabric that we we sell is designed to be recyclable so uh, the design part is very important okay, okay. this is uh, all uh, the process uh, uh, that we are working for uh, for for this project, okay. Um, this is the every year up to thirty percent of all the clothes that are produced eventually uh, remain unsold. So there is a big opportunity also to recuperate uh, uh, garments that they are unsold and now they are thrown away all around uh, in Chile, in uh, in Africa. They, they are full of desert, full of clothes. Uh, uh, you will see, I think, in the next year, a beautiful uh, documentary uh, that was filming also in our company and which uh, of one of the most important Oscar uh, um, producer uh, that uh, is filming a movie for the for the fashion industry and uh, is go it was going uh, she was going in, in Africa and also in Chile to to see all uh, this desert. Um, and this is the, the project 53, where we are taking back uh, uh, all uh, um, old garments or uh, um, garments that are unsold. Okay, so this is the part also where it is important to eco design uh, the, the garment. Okay, you can go, go on. This is uh, all the process. Um, and then, I mean, we have a website where it is very transparent and uh, but what, what, what I want to say to, to these young uh, uh, people and uh, to, to be curious and to, to think always that, I mean, now you have a big, huge opportunity because all the business model of, of all the category of the business are, are changing and you have, a, uh, if you have the, you need only to choose uh, with your passion uh, which uh, sector you want, where you want to work, and uh, and then on that sector to be curious how to avoid uh, water, CO2, uh, electricity, and also the, the social responsibility is also important. So the people that working on the machine uh, to be uh, always uh, in security, to be always uh, uh, to have the opportunity to uh, to stay well, to stay uh, focused also on the work they are doing. So, I mean, you have a you have a big opportunity also in the fashion because we need uh, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of innovation. Uh, so, uh, if you have any question and or if you want to visit us, uh, we are here uh, very close to to Florence, and we have a circular economy lab where you can visit uh, and uh, we can show you what I was telling uh, today, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your presentation because uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, engineers can really contribute uh, to, to the implementation of, of uh, sustainability. So uh, now there is just one last presentation, which is mine, that is, uh, Super, uh, that uh, is due before the the end of uh, um, of this event. Um, so let's go back to the beginning, to the starting point. Uh, we we met here uh, today because uh, we have started. We have decided to to, to start a, a new master master program, and uh, the idea was to 
to talk about sustainability and uh, also to make a check with uh, with companies with uh, different uh, industrial sectors if we uh, were in, in the right direction so um what is a few words on uh, on the master uh, so what, what is uh, mess uh, mechanical engineering for sustainability sorry There are technical issues. <laughs> so, um, what what is uh, this this master? It, it is is a two year master. So, in uh, uh, well inserted in the Bologna process in the three plus uh, plus two, not a one year master. And uh, since uh, uh, today you saw that uh, there are different aspects of sustainability we decided to activate uh, three curricula on uh, design on energy technologies and on uh, on mobility and uh, this is uh, a great uh, um, commitment sorry and uh, we started uh, with uh, with this idea uh, for several reasons, and I, I hope that you you will uh, recognize in, in the actions, uh, in, in the lessons uh, that, that you will follow or other ones will follow uh, after you. So the basic idea was that we wanted to develop new professional uh, profiles. So by by joining uh, uh, this master, uh, I hope that you will uh, um, share with us this uh, this view. And the idea of these uh, new professional profiles is, as many speakers have said today, because there is an ongoing ecological transition and there is the, the need uh, to have new people with different competences to support this. But uh, we, we also thought about uh, uh, new uh, ways of uh, um, transfer knowledge. So the, this idea, this new master is really based on the idea of learning by, by making. And uh, uh, you, you will see in different uh, uh, approaches during uh, uh, the two years. Then uh, uh, so English, English because uh, it's, a, it's a door to, to, to share the experience with other people from other countries uh, so it's it's uh, a door on an international dimension of uh, your career the organization of, of of the master of mass so there is a central uh, um, area of competences that is uh, really uh, given a, during the first year of, of the master. And uh, already uh, towards the end of the first year, we will differentiate in the three different curricula that I mentioned before. So design, energy technologies, and, and mobility. And uh, before going into, I would say, the keywords of uh, the different uh, uh, parts of this uh, master, I, I want to... Uh, just to uh, highlight uh, some uh, um, educational uh, approaches uh, that uh, indeed uh, are linked to what I was saying before, the learning by, by making. So basically we have uh, uh, two project works, uh, one uh, in the first year, uh, the second semester of the first year, that is focused on learning and practicing soft skills because you will need to 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 share uh, your ideas to communicate your ideas to receive inputs to work in teams and uh, um, at least in our department uh, this is the first time that we include such skills uh, in a master program explicitly i mean and and then uh, uh, there is the project work of, of the second year there will be more than one uh, we have uh, in total six different project works. These are technical ones, and uh, uh, you will have the opportunity to choose uh, among uh, the educational offer uh, of each curriculum. 
basically the the objective of this project work is uh, to develop a practical activity so with a, an interdisciplinary approach and working in teams so at least two people for a project and uh, then we would like also to have the involvement of industrial experts uh, both in the definition of uh, the uh, design uh, specifications but also in the development of of the project and uh, and this is really something that we see as a first step uh, before the traineeship and the thesis that we hope that you, you will do uh, that you will develop uh, in partnership with uh, with companies so that's why the title of this slide is a path to job placement and uh, then le let's go into uh, into the program of, of the master so um if you have a look at, uh, at the website of the student guide, uh, there are a lot of tables. And I didn't want to, to show uh, these tables today here. So I just created some word clouds. Uh, and, and these are the keywords uh, of uh, the first here common courses. So basically, you have a product, life cycle, assessment, uh, you have teamwork transversal skills, you have uh, policies, you have regulations, and uh, also uh, David Storer mentioned uh, new regulations coming next year. So regulations are probably not so funny, but are really uh, fundamental for, for the development of your skills, because you will have to work and to comply with these uh, regulations. So it's necessary knowledge then to apply and develop uh, uh, probably more interesting things. Uh, so uh, you have energy, but you have also the opportunity to, to choose during the first year also other uh, elective courses on power electronics, uh, uh, management of water and waste, which, uh, for instance, uh, this topic is uh, really important also in the textile sector. But uh, let's go on. Uh, if we uh, stay in the curriculum uh, design, then uh, we, we go into more traditional uh, uh, topics, really uh, finite elements, but also digital uh, twins of systems. We have uh, light weighting, we have uh, additive manufacturing, we have uh, new production uh, technologies. So all, all of these uh, are within this curriculum. And uh, the project work is on re-engineering uh, a, a product or a subsystem. So as a direct application of what you have uh, learned up to that moment. We have the energy technologies. So uh, here there is wind in, in representation of energy technologies. So uh, in, in this uh, uh, curriculum, we have, uh, the, uh, we have courses for the development of, of new um, of new products. So there is uh, the big word innovation. There is a, a environmental impact. We have uh, energy systems, renewable energies, energy conversion technologies that were mentioned in the beginning of this uh, session. Uh, we have, again, mechatronic systems. Uh, that's, uh, we have uh, air pollutants, so the study of uh, the generation of air pollutants and uh, their dispersion. And there is also the necessity to uh, have an integration with the grid because the energy that uh, will be generated uh, have to be uh, transmitted uh, and uh, stored again, as was said before. And um, I go then to the last uh, curriculum. Uh, here there is uh, a representation of mobility, there is a car, but obviously we are not uh, only thinking about car, also motorcycles, but also public transport, for instance, uh, urban rail transport is a, uh, is a course that you, you will have uh, the opportunity to cho choose uh, uh, during the second year. There is a uh, mobility, mobility as a system, so there is a uh, mobility planning, um, a study also on uh, transport systems. But again, uh, there is a, a, 
the, the fact that everything needs to be sustainable. So in attention to end of life, as mentioned by several speakers uh, today, light weighting, because uh, in, uh, in the automotive sector, light weighting uh, is a really important uh, trend. But then if we are uh, producing and developing new things, there is also the need of testing them. So there is a testing of mechanical parts, but also testing in uh, uh, declined as uh, el electric testing, because uh, if we have electric vehicles, uh, we need to have both uh, uh, competences. So that uh, was uh, my presentation. Uh, I made a long story short because uh, the story started one and a half year ago and I had to summarize uh, everything in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but I, I hope that uh, the story will be a long story for you that you uh, choose to um, to share this vision with us by enrolling in this master. And I hope that uh, uh, among you, there are also people that will be interested in, uh, in doing the same choice next, uh, next year. And uh, that probably, uh, hopefully, this will spread uh, uh, through across uh, um, new, new uh, academic years with more and more uh, students interested in, uh, in this master. These are the reference, the official website of, uh, of the master and the official email. If you need uh, information, uh, just write and uh, myself or the delegate uh, for the incoming students uh, will, will contact you and fix an appointment. Thank you very much. So thank you to all the speakers that I uh, hear in presence, but also to all the speakers that have joined uh, and uh, that have shared uh, with, with us their um, views. Uh, I hope that all of you uh, had uh, uh, have grasped something and that uh, at least a few words uh, um, could give you uh, an idea of what could be your uh, future career once that you you will uh, end uh, uh, this master uh, this master program so thank you for for being here today and see you in the classroom <laughs>